Hello. Welcome. Just listening in for the first time. Okay. Welcome. Sorry about being late. I went to the uh, I went to the Google Meet link and I sat there for a few minutes, <laughs> wondered where everybody was. Sorry, but, uh, I saw a second link there. So here we are. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah, um, yeah we'll go ahead and uh, give folks uh, another couple minutes here. And um, are you okay with it be recorded? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. All right. Yeah, and if you have anything you want to present, go ahead and pull on it. So who's here? We have a few folks here. Yeah, shrug, wall. I know a few folks like to watch the videos after we get them up on YouTube. No, no. So, Chirag and myself are from uh, Microsoft. Oh, cool. We've been uh, we've been reading up our TraceQL and very interested in seeing what's going to be the standard for tracing because there isn't one. And uh, so we are uh, to just listen and see as Microsoft's been working on. What next? What do we invest in? Do we invent our own query language, or do we kind of, kind of, uh, if there is one which is being accepted widely, should we kind of, you know, adopt that? So that's why me and Chiragaya, Kalyan would have joined as well, and uh, Juanis was working with us in the past, so we are very, we've been kind of reading about TradeSQL for a while now. <laughs> that's cool. All right, okay. uh, I love to hear that. Very neat. Cool. And are you all on the Microsoft property side, or are you working with the LinkedIn observability folks as well? The Microsoft Azure Monitor side. Okay. Cool. Yeah, because I know the my old team is over at uh, LinkedIn, and they're ramping up on tracing too, so probably working with them. Yeah, that's right. We've been in touch with them. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. So now it's uh, six after. So um, for anybody checking in on video later or for uh, you folks who joined. So thank you very much for joining. Um, and welcome back after a bit of a respite. Uh, the first half of the year, sorry, I didn't have any meetings. I was really uh, tied up with other things. Uh, but now we're catching up and trying to bring this project to a close, hopefully, within a year, <laughs> maybe a little bit in the next year. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for being willing to present uh, GraphQL to us and kind of your journey um, working on a language for it. Um, I know a few folks like Yuri from Jaeger are really interested in it and think it's a good language. So we're interested to hear about your learnings. So please take it away. Sure. Uh, glad to be here. I have this somewhat functional presentation. Uh, anyone is welcome to uh, interrupt and ask questions. Uh, this isn't exactly a canned scripted thing. So um, feel free to jump in. We can make this conversation. And then of course, afterwards we can chat and ask, uh, you're welcome to ask anything you want. Uh, like Chris was saying, we developed this um, a few years back. God, it's been four or five years. I'm not sure anymore. Um, and uh, Yuri was involved from Uber, formerly Uber, now Meta. Uh, and he is, I think at this point, probably the uh, open source tracing expert worldwide. Uh, he is very interested in this language. And then internally we had uh, Tom Wilkie and myself and a few other folks uh, from Grafana. Um, I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to go through what our goals were, and I'm going to talk about how I feel like close we came to some of these goals, and a little bit if they were good goals also towards the end. Um, uh, I, Like I said, feel free to jump in. I don't know why it says 19th of May 2021. <laughs> I clearly forgot to remove it from the template. Uh, this is a pretty raw presentation. I was throwing it together yesterday afternoon a little bit this morning. Um, uh, I meant for it more, more to be like a conversation piece than a really clean presentation. All right, so goals. Um, we really wanted to accomplish a few things. Uh, we wanted a tracing DSL. Um, uh, there are a fair number of people who have done SQL-like things on top of tracing, and I, uh, I'm not opposed to that. It's just not the direction we want to go. Uh, SQL, using a known query language and applying it to a different domain has some advantages. Uh, people come in with this idea that they can just, oh, I know SQL, I can just use this. Um, but we really wanted something designed specifically to work with tracing data itself. Um, and some of our goals there were we wanted to su support the structural nature of tracing directly. Um, that can be difficult sometimes in SQL. You get into this like recursive SQL thing, which can be um, rough. We want it to be compact. We want to be very succinct and ask the kinds of questions people want to ask about tracing in direct ways. Uh, and we want it to be exploratory, and that's an important um, that's an important philosophy at Grafana with query languages. That uh, we we want a language where you can write a question, ask a question of a database, get some kind of feedback, and enter a feedback loop where you make a small adjustment and learn something new, and then make a small adjustment and then learn something new. And we wanted this experience with tracing. We believe that that is one of the reasons PromQL has done so well is because you can explore your information, your data, your metrics. And it was important to us to capture that with TraceQL as well. Another goal was that it was Prometheus-y, Prometheus-like. Um, we, uh, Pr PromQL, of course, is very popular. A lot of people know it. And we did not want to use PromQL. We didn't want to use SQL either. But we wanted there to be uh, a certain amount of carryover. Like, you, oh, I, I use PromQL. Uh, I'm confident in that language. I have a whole host of developers who are comfortable using that. Um, can I learn TraceQL? So one of our goals was that there'd be some amount of like carryover, some, some of your knowledge of PromQL would work in the TraceQL world. Uh, and the final thing is uh, we wanted to be, I didn't know what word to use here, Hotel native, Hotel compliant. Uh, we wanted it to be able to query the Hotel object model is the truth. Uh, uh, o o Tempo, I think, was the first Hotel native database when we when I first started the very first commit of Tempo. Uh, Open Telemetry was pretty new, but it was clearly the inheritor of Open Tracing, and they had a very mature object model. They had good clients, and it was a somewhat obvious pick. Uh, Open Telemetry has grown an enormous amount, and its impact has grown quite a bit since then, um, which is good for Tempo. 
But at the time it was just like the open source tracing implementation. And so we, from the very beginning were uh, supported OTEL ingestion and querying data. And so our language is, I, I guess I would say almost tightly coupled with that object model. Um, it is a very mature object model that comes from open tracing. So I'm not particularly concerned about that. Tracing DSL. So I don't know how, I didn't know how familiar people would be with tracing. I did want to do a real quick, like what is tracing thing. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this cause I do have the expectation. Most people roughly know what's going on here. Um, but a trace is composed of these spans, right? A span will uh, mark a series of time that it takes to perform an operation. And primarily traces or spans live in a hierarchical nature. I don't think I captured that very well here. But the primary relationship of spans is you have a root span and then child spans, and then each child span can have more children. And it maps out a tree that describes the way we um, do a lot of things, but um, most normally service a request. Um, uh, there are other kinds of relationships in tracing, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit here. Uh, there's also all of this concept of what you can decorate a span with. By default, it comes with some uh, what we call intrinsic information, like the duration and the start time are intrinsic to the span. They always exist. The name is intrinsic. There's also fields like the kind of span, uh, span uh, the, uh, the status of the span, if it's okay or in error. Most spans are unset, we found, but uh, error is common as well. Um, and then kind, like server and client and some of these other uh, ideas. And then there's also the concept of attributes, which are dynamic uh, values that you can attach to a span. So all of these attributes are key value pairs that are uh, dynamically added to the span at the time it is created and then describe, give us good metadata about what is occurring uh, during the span. So this particular one um, is a git on a HTTP endpoint. Um, and here's some of the data that describes it. And we have a rough sense of how long it took and how it lives in a relationship of different services and where how they work together to respond to some kind of HTTP query farther up the chain. So this is our challenge, is finding a language that queries this. Um, we need a way to query a complex structure, um, which is a bit different than metrics or logs, where often in metrics and logs you're querying, or at least at Grafana, maybe I think other people take this different directions, but Grafana, you're querying a stream of data, a stream of metrics from one a service, uh, a stream of logs from one service. You can aggregate those in different ways, but that stream of data is a much simpler, um, much simpler kind of structure to query. And we're querying this this beast right here. Um, okay, I, I can think I touched on a lot of this, but uh, we think of our we think of TraceQL as a pipeline of span sets. They live in this hierarchical relationship. Um, they have events. They have links. They have attributes. I guess I didn't mention events and links. I didn't, don't know if I captured one. Yeah, I did not capture, I apologize. But uh, a span can have an event, it can also have a link to other spans. And then uh, it also has a resource. So like information about the process that created that span. Uh, and then something called a scope, which is a bit more OTEL um, specific, uh, but we do have some support for that as well. We're gonna talk about what I mean when I say pipeline of span sets in a second. Um, uh, but right, so this is kind of our challenge. We have this, primary thing that we keyed our language around the span or the span set. And then that has all these different things, attributes, events, links, as well as resource and other uh, things that we need to figure out how to query. So compact and succinct, let's see if we pulled it off. Um, span.foo equals three. This would be the way you query for an attribute on a span in TraceQL. So if a span has the attribute foo and its value was three, then this would match essentially. Uh, here, the second line is how we do what we call intrinsics, span colon kind. So the colon kind of uh, uh, shows it is intrinsic. Um, you could have an attribute named kind. <laughs> we had to deal with that problem. So you could, have, you could have a kind or you could have an attribute named status or you can have an attribute named name. And all of, so you have to have a way to describe whether or not you're querying uh, the intrinsic value or the attribute. Uh, so that's how we do it here between this dot and the colon. Uh, here's how we query at the resource. So there's one resource for every span, which is nice. So when I say resource service name foo, I can clearly check this uh, the resource service name for each span. 
and determine if it's uh, if that value is equal. And then this is where things get a little weird. And this is kind of a current, um, I don't know if issue is the right word, but challenge in our language for sure. We're expanding it to handle events and links, which are, exist in a many to one relationship to the span, which is a little different. And we've settled on a very conservative syntax right now and are discussing internally about how do we grow that to handle more complex relationships in our events, essentially. So right now, uh, event name exception, we'll look for any uh, span that has an event named exception and return that span. Um, but these get, again, get a little bit a little more complex uh, because there could be 10 spans and all 10 of them could have the name exception or one of the 10 could have name, name exception. And is it important to be able to query those in different ways? Is it important to ask more specific questions about those events? We're still trying to figure that out ourselves and figure out how to make our language handle that, that situation. Uh, and then uh, TraceQL, and uh, some days I regret this, but it is very expressive. You can do ands and ors, parentheses, all kinds of different constructions, Boolean constructions, exactly like you'd expect to be able to do in a, in a, a programming language, in a procedural language, if, and then you open up a big condition and you can combine your uh, Boolean operators and conditions any way you want. Um, and it's very expressive. It's not often used, uh, but it allows for very powerful uh, combinations of uh, the different uh, conditions here, basically. Um, okay, so let me back up. These different, this curly brace here says, I'm selecting a set of spans. So span.foo will match every uh, span in a trace where there's an attribute foo with the, foo with the value three, and, those, uh, and uh, those would be returned by the language, essentially by tempo in this case, or whatever was uh, using or uh, implementing language. Uh, sometimes we want to assert conditions on multiple sets of spans. So we have the ability to do that. So let's say we are interested in, maybe I should put some examples here, uh, span, uh, maybe we want to find a trace that has two different services in it. We could do um, resource service name uh, equals, oops, sorry, I lost myself there. I just got paged, but we're all good here. Um, <laughs> we can do, uh, let's say we wanted to find, uh, let me just edit this slide. We can find, for instance, let's say we wanted to find a trace where uh, resource.service.name equals foo and resource.service.name is bar. This is how you would say that in traceql. So you would take two different span sets. You would look for spans that match your conditions, and then this would find a trace where both of that was true. Uh, both of those things were true. This will return nothing. And this is a little bit um, maybe not intuitive. Some people think like, oh, I'm looking for a trace with these two services. Let me type them both in. Uh, and this doesn't work because this is saying find me a span where resource service name is foo and resource service name is bar, which is impossible. Um, so uh, we use, uh, and so we have these span set operators. Each of these will select a set of spans. This operator will combine those span sets together. In this case, we'll just confirm that they both exist in the trace. So this is, I don't want to say a miss, but it is a confusing element to the language. Almost everyone writes uh, a set of conditions with a bunch of ands in between it, like over and over and over again. And that mostly works for everyone. That's for most people who are looking for a trace, they say things like, oh, I'm looking for this service. Uh, I'm looking for, uh, and this, and the duration is greater than one second or and the duration is greater than five seconds, or this service and HTTP status code is 500. These are by far most common kind of queries, and that works very nicely and clearly in TraceQL. Just say exactly what you want, and I, I like it with the and in, in between the curly braces. I do think it gets a bit complex when you start combining these, and this is where people fall down a little bit. Um, this is a particular element of TraceQL we're very proud of. This is a structural operator. Um, this one will look for descendants. So this will return traces. It'll find all spans where this, where resource service name is foo, all spans where resource service name is bar, and look for uh, descendants from one to the next. So you'll find all traces where foo eventually calls bar somewhere. And this builds into our desire to make uh, a native tracing DSL. We really wanted uh, structural operations. We really wanted the structure of the trace to play an important role in the language. 
So you could ask very direct, clear, tight, succinct questions about the way your services are talking to each other or your endpoints or your databases or whatever you're interested in. So we have this concept of structural operators, which is very important in TraceQL. All right, exploratory. Ooh, it's getting complicated, right? But I wanted to talk about this. I wanted to show how we use this and how I use this to find traces internally sometimes. And how I also learn interesting things about a language. Often when I'm in Loki or you know, checking my logs or I'm asking PromQL, I'm, asking, I'm writing PromQL queries, I have a problem, right? And so I'm looking for a problem. And what I love about those languages and what I love about TraceQL is while I'm finding the problem, I learn all kinds of other things because I'm writing a language that allows me to um, ask uh, questions and make small changes and learn new things. And I go and solve my problem hopefully eventually but on the way, I learned new things about how my application operates, about maybe challenges, things I should be concerned about, things that are working well or not so much. Um, so this is a common kind of query. I'm looking for uh, server spans, maybe a specific path here, slash foo. And I want to find any error beneath that. This is a very pop popular query. So slash foo is having issues. I don't know why. I can use this query to find descendant spans that are in error, and it can quickly help me find that uh, a database is having issues somewhere five services below this, perhaps, or whatever. Latency, similar kind of query. So maybe I write my status query. I can very quickly change this. Uh, OK, I now know maybe why it's an error. Let me double check where latency might be coming from. So this will find all uh, descendant spans that are, have a latency greater than one second. So I can see maybe where the long, the critical path beneath my services and what is pushing out the length of slash foo right now. So I can go maybe. Uh, bring another team in or uh, go double check another service or go deep dive some other problem. I can very quickly determine what is below my endpoint that's causing issues. But I can also answer, ask cool questions that maybe have nothing to do with the current issue I'm dealing with. Maybe I just want to see a map of all the services uh, beneath Foo. So this will do this right here. So slash Foo, just show me all spans that are of kind server. So that will show you the tree, all of the different spans anywhere beneath foo that are of type server, which is basically an entry point into a service. And I can use this to learn what services exist beneath foo and how do they talk to each other and what's the hierarchy. It's a very powerful kind of question. Or maybe I just want to see all the databases anywhere beneath foo. Like how many relational databases are queried every time you curl foo? Uh, is it 15 and uh, oh man, we should probably figure that out. Is it 100? Is it two? Is it zero? Like this kind of question is going to give you that answer. So uh, I love that the language that's important to me, like we said earlier, it lets you learn and explore uh, your data. Um, this is very much a power user fantasy, for sure. Uh, but this is a certain niche that we love at Grafana and we connect to very powerfully um, at Grafana. And we, we write a lot of our applications too. Um, PromQL is a power user uh, tool. Uh, LogQL, in the end, is a power user tool. The basic things are easy. They're straightforward. But once you become proficient, like, the things you can learn are um, uh, very, very powerful. Hmm? Do you have a question? Oh, oh sorry. Just uh, thank you. OK, so success. Did we achieve success in this criteria? I think we did. I think we made a very powerful tracing DSO. Uh, I think uh, there are questions about the impact of a new domain-specific language, but I think we did a good job bringing it together. Uh, and I'm very proud of the language we put together. There are some questions surrounding this events and links that we haven't quite figured out. We have some internal syntaxes we've been toying with. Um, nothing we're super happy about, and that's why we've added maybe a small step towards events and links. And I, but I think we'll crack that eventually and bring it into TraceQL in a way that feels natural and powerful. Does TraceScale projection operations if I only want a few columns of a span? Great question. Let me um, let me oops, let me go back for a second. I'd be glad to show you that. Um, we're just going to use this as scratch now. Boink. Oops. Uh, control M. Maybe Control M. Yeah. Okay. That's new. Um, so let's say I do span dot foo is greater than three. Uh, by default, TraceQL will basically only bring back the value three. It's only going to, I mean, TraceQL is based on Parquet, which doesn't matter. This is not about the implementation. But uh, the language will only return the value of foo. So if foo was four or a thousand or 10,000, that is returned along with, uh, along with the metadata for this query. Uh, it does have the ability to do this. 
So standhtp.bat, for instance. So a common kind of uh, a common kind of construction on this particular query is this. So I want to find all of the databases, perhaps, that are beneath my endpoint. Well, I also don't just care about databases. Why don't, why don't you show me span.db.sig or um, you know, resource.cluster so I can see where resource.namespace or you know, whatever makes sense in your org, resource.region, uh, perhaps. So yes, you assert your conditions. After those are done, you can write a select statement that will bring in additional columns that were unrelated to the actual query itself. It used to be that wasn't true, and you'd have to you could like cheat it by saying and span that BB statement, you know, does not equal this. That would cheat and bring it in, but it was kind of expensive. This is better. It only brings in the um, columns. It only brings in the columns that uh, you ask for, and it only brings in those in if the rest of the query matches successfully. Good question. So select is our operator for that. Uh, yeah, and like I said, uh, I think I think we did a good job here. I'm proud of the work we did. I think we made something powerful. It has a lot of people have connected to it, as expected. A lot of people have been, you know, maybe uh, uh, hesitant to learn a new tra tracing language, but those who have found, uh, who have learned and have uh, enjoyed TraceQL, have found it's very powerful, and you can do some very cool things with it. TempoDB uh, pointed me to someone else. Ooh. So as I understand, executes the trace field filters in place at the time of reading the trace in the row group. Does that mean any later office match not consider when finding correct matching conditions, for example? Um, OK, so Tempo itself, if we want to talk implementation a bit, um, does co-locate traces to perform those structural operations? Yes. Um, we uh, have like different kinds of timeouts and buffer periods to do our best to make sure a trace is completely co-located. And then we have like a compaction operation after uh, we have ingested a trace to again, attempt to bring it together. Um, but it is true that if you sent like um, 10 spans in a trace today and 10 spans in a trace tomorrow, uh, Tempo itself would not find structural relationships between those spans. So these structural relationships are most powerful in the common case for tracing, which is you know, HTTP requests or gRPC requests, and struggles a bit um, in other kinds of applications, like let's say you have a three day long batch job, which some people do trace, absolutely. So you have a large batch job, those kind of structural operations do not work as well. Is TraceQL open source? Yeah, as is Tempo. It is, I think I'm sharing the screen. There. Uh, thanks for clarity. Oh, yeah. No problem. Uh, cool. So, success, yes. Prometheus E. Are we Prometheus E? Um, let's see. So, Tampa or TraceQL, <laughs> TraceQL, like Prometheus, has curly braces. And that's about the end of the things I could say that are similar between Prometheus and TraceQL. Um, in the beginning, it was something of a goal to make these similar enough that you were, you know, working in one language and you um, could go to another language, and you could go from PromQL over to TraceQL, and you'd be like, "Oh, I understand some things here." And okay, maybe, but I really think um, I really think this was a miss. I don't even think it was a good goal from the beginning. Um, the data models are too different. Uh, for instance, OTEL has strings and floats and ints and maps and lists and all kinds of attribute types. And Prometheus has strings. All you can do is string key value pairs. Um, so immediately, like we are dealing with different data types. Uh, TraceQL allows in or in Prometheus, you do all of your conditions like, oops, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. You do all your conditions like this. Uh, you know, with, sorry, I had some of you online that oh, and I'm not copying, pasting well. But you do uh, all of your conditions with commas. So foo equals bar and baz equals bar. And I never liked that because what does a comma mean? <laughs> Uh, I wanted more expressive ways to combine um, data like ands and ors, and I wanted to be very clear to the uh, query writer if they were what operation they were performing between their Boolean operations, and I wanted to be more expressive. So we added these instead of just the comma, like in PromQL. 
Uh, in addition, this we're just querying something different. And this really also kind of hit us um, when we started TraceQL metrics. There's no streams in tracing. Like there are PromQL at its core has an object model that is a stream of data coming from a single process. And everything about the language is keyed around querying that object model. And these do not exist in tracing. And you are querying instead a series of objects that were, there's a lot of things you could, there's a lot of ways to perhaps break down the way to query traces. The way we did was consider a series of objects that was a trace and then writing an expression that was evaluated over that trace to do some of these complicated hierarchical and other, uh, other kind of um, uh, structural queries. So it was just turned out to be so different. The thing we are attempting to query was so different, we decided we, it was okay that we had drifted from uh, Prometheus, basically. Uh, metrics. So in, uh, in PromQL, you'd write something like this top query, some rate of span.foo equals bar over one minute. Uh, and then you would like, you could aggregate by name, perhaps span name. Uh, in TraceQL, we write this. We are a piped language. I really do not like the mix of pipes and functions. Um, I really also like piped languages, which is perhaps why TraceQL is a piped language. And so when we first added TraceQL metrics, when we first started defining what the language would look like when you're uh, aggregating spans into uh, metrics, we had a fair amount of pressure to do this top thing. Uh, Loki does this, LogQL does this. Uh, and it was another attempt to be like, let's make TraceQL like Prometheus. Let's, uh, let's connect to this body of knowledge that people already have. But I really personally disliked it. Um, I really like this. I think it's far cleaner and it is more uh, native to the language we were trying to create. There's also some inconsistencies here, this sum. The sum exists in, in Prometheus because you are summing together streams. We write some rate in PromQL over and over again, because the rate gets the individual rate of a stream, a single stream, and some will aggregate those all together in the way I'd like. And there are no streams in trip tempo. So there is a lot of Prometheus-isms, a lot of native knowledge to the way you query Prometheus, and also a, a log QL as well, that just doesn't exist in tempo. And I didn't want to play the game of let's make a thing that looks really similar, but in fact functions so differently that a lot of your native instincts are wrong. I preferred writing something, creating something that was native to the way we wanted to write, tracing languages native to the way we were, the language itself was built and would not create this like gap, this confusion essentially. So we started off at the very beginning with this goal to make it prometheus -y and gave up. And then when we did trace the oil metrics, we had a similar moment where it's like, we had some even external partners and uh, uh, community members who were like, let's make it like Prometheus, please. And we pushed back and we made what we uh, felt was the right, uh, the right choice. And I still believe that this was the right choice. Um, I still much prefer this path uh, to the Prometheus-y path. Success? I think no. Uh, we quickly realized I think this was a bad goal um, and decided to buy it. Uh, Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, um, kind of tied in with that, the prometheus -y thing. Uh, thanks for not going that route. It was kind of internal Google details way back when, and then it made its way and opened the TSD and it drove me nuts. Um, but for the metrics, um, are you able to extract, let's say somebody stores a metric as a attribute in a span or in the future potentially as an event? Because I have found that actually really useful for batch mode. Yeah. So we are adding, I'll show you the entirety of trace fuel metrics right here. It's that small. We are adding rate, uh, which is in the language now and in our cloud stuff and in open source. Uh, we are adding histogram quantum. Uh, and this takes a field. So the common field is duration, right? I want to know the P99, P90 of a set of spans. So I would put like name equals foo, or right, I'd put my conditions over here, I'd pick the spans I want, I'd pipe that into my quantile, and I say the field I want to do the quantile of. So I can pick duration, but we were having some fun earlier doing this, which is somewhat nonsensical, but fun. Uh, TraceQ will do it. So any number attribute in your span is accessible for these the language to, um, uh, to perform the quantile. Uh, a function over it. And we have one other, which is just, um, crap, a histogram. So you can just do, if you want, if all you want is the histogram itself, the raw data, the heat map, you can do that. 
if you want the end this just takes i believe a I'm not 100 sure uh, that just takes a field uh this will do the quantile relate for you to give you p99 p90 in fact my bad we don't call this histogram quantile because histogram quantile is a prometheus thing because they store histograms see look at me i'm already like falling back to prompt you all uh we have quantile we have histogram and we have rate and we're going to pause a little bit on this we do feel like it would be easy to throw a million things in here and we want we feel like this is covers such a huge number of use cases that we are going to pause and see what the community thinks, see what people want after this, and not push a bunch of new features into this. Um, oh, yeah, these can both all, all support buy as well. So buy whatever you want. You know, and this is also any attribute uh, in your span, any attribute at the resource level, any attribute at the, um, or any intrinsic as well. So it is flexible in that way. Oh, is there support for span links? Yep. Uh, we are, oh, well, that, I think there's a PR up right now, literally as we speak to do links. Uh, no, is it events? Yeah, okay, at events. Okay, events and links, we just revved our backend format. Uh, the, we went from vpark 3 to vpark 4 which is whatever. It's our implementation and we are adding support right now. The language does have support. Uh, for it, we are adding our own implementation uh, to take you somewhere that might help. Docs, uh, design proposals, this, I'll add this to the chat. Um, this has the original doc we published, um, which is not a complete spec, but is what we called concepts. We didn't want to publish a 500 page spec or something that no one would read. We wanted to publish what we thought our community wanted, which is the concepts and ideas we were we thought were important in a language. So this was probably worth a read for anybody on this call. And then this is our, oh, sorry, we have two follow-ups. The extensions is our latest group, which included events, links, scope. Uh, we added IDs to the language and some other uh, thoughts. And then this link here is also good. This is our ideas on metrics and how we wanted to do metrics. So that would be a great resource. Anybody here is interested in language uh, development generally or TraceQL specifically, uh, these three docs are going to show a lot about how where we started and some of our uh, extensions and where we went, essentially. Cool. Uh, all right. Open telemetry. Are we open telemetry? Um, so on the left, I really spent a fair amount of time looking for a better diagram of the open telemetry object model. Um, I could not find. So this is the proto, <laughs> all decommented and slammed into a slide. As you could tell, this was done at the last minute. Um, we support directly a lot of the fields in open telemetry, and we don't do it because it's open telemetry. We do it because it is a very mature and thoughtful model on tracing, is the truth. Uh, I was involved in open tracing a fair amount. I'm a maintainer of Jaeger. Um, open telemetry came from open census uh, and open tracing, and a lot of that maturity and a lot of that knowledge in how to do distributed tracing went to open telemetry. And so um, we chose to directly support a lot of these because they make sense. Uh, there's actually some things we don't support, and it's not, and in part because we just don't think it's worth querying. Um, but for the most part, the open telemetry object model is very rich um, and mature and can get done what you need to get done. So I've got the proto over here, which is the thing you're pushing into Tempo or you're pushing into Jaeger or you're pushing into any of the various vendors or open source options for distributed tracing. Um, and we directly support querying on this. I really like this. Um, I think it resonates. We have a lot of people who are just in open telemetry talking to us at Grafana. And when you can say, hey, if you know your object model, if you know the data you're producing, you can query that directly. I think it's meaningful to a lot of SREs, a lot of operators, a lot of developers. Um, because a lot of developers, again, this is kind of a power user thing, are digging in and they know the thing they're creating. They know what the telemetry looks like that they're producing. And they love the ability to have this one-to-one -one relationship between the language they're using and the telemetry they produce. Um, so I think this was a smart choice in the end. But like trace ID, span ID, these are pretty recent additions. Excuse me. Uh, span name, of course, this is, old and very common, uh, a very common field, very important field on a span. 
kind. Uh, this I have the kinds up here, but this is directly queryable in TraceQL. The duration. I also really want to add start time to 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 spans. We have a few people asking for that, and I have come across occasionally a reason to add it. Um, here's your attributes. This is just general key value pairs, and we've talked about that before. You got the dot operator span dot. Um, you have events, so event name and event at dot. So this is how you do intrinsics on events, which right now we only support name, but we really want to support uh, time since the start of the span. So you can say, show me a trace where it took a second to acquire a lock, for instance, or show me a trace where it took a second to establish a TCP connection if you have those events in your span. Uh, we have attributes on events. Here's the links. So trace ID, span ID, and the link attributes also. Um, one of the challenges with the links is links imply relationships between spans that we do not have support for in our structural queries. And I'm not sure where we're going to go with that. Uh, it's not a common request. So there's not a lot of like pressure, perhaps, to, to do this. But uh, I sometimes wonder if we should. The problem is a trace is a tree, often which is very nice. Uh, links can create graphs, which becomes more complicated. <laughs> and then links can not only create graphs within a trace, they can start creating graphs with other traces. And we have an issue up right now that's like, hey, I want to do structural operators between three, three traces. And I'm pushing back like this. There's no way to make this performant. There's billions of traces in your backend or in our backends. And finding these and doing this is impossible. Uh, they have conceded that fact. They still want it. They just want it to not be poor. They don't care. They're like, just look everywhere. I'm like, all right, sure. Uh, submit a PR. Thanks. Um, so status, of course, status is very important. Uh, OK, error. In fact, it's either unset or error. I very, very rarely see status is set to OK. It happens. But basically, no one sets a status unless something has failed. And then they set uh, status to error. And then we also support, there's a status message, message, which is like a special string field, which has specific information. Like if you set it to error, maybe you put in there context canceled or um, you know whatever, database timeout, or you can add a little detail in the status message. Cool. And uh, success, I think that was a success. I think it was a good goal. I think we picked a good framework to, to connect to, to couple with. Uh, Open Telemetry has gone a long way since we did this. And uh, I'm very happy with that decision. It was, it, we, I think we both pulled it off. I think it resonates with our customers. And I think, um, uh, and I think it was right from the beginning, a, a, a good decision. Sometimes you get lucky, right? Um, and that's the that's the extent. That's the that's the whole presentation. Uh, we can do questions. Let me see if there's any in there. Oh, the design proposals question. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have some questions? We can just you're welcome to type them in chat or unmute whatever you're comfortable with, and we can talk about Trisco. Yeah, no, we're almost at the end of the official time. Do you have a few more minutes to hang around, Joe, and answer any other questions? Yeah, we can we can do the next 15 or so if there's questions. I don't mind. Yeah. For anybody who has to drop off, I want to thank you for joining and thank you, Joe, too. I did have some questions, um, unless anybody else wants to jump in first. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Kanwal, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Joe kind of addressed it. It was more about the querying, the related spans, like the trace with the span links, you can kind of build a graph of traces. So I think Joe kind of answered that that's not something that will scale. So. Yeah, we do have, we have one customer who, I don't know how they did this. It's the only person I've seen do this, but they occasionally set up parent-child relationships without the parent ID. The normal thing is your span has a parent ID, right? That points to the parent. Yeah. Um, they, for some reason, have uh, they have parent-child relationships established through child of links. And I don't know what their instrumentation looks like to possibly have pulled this off, but they've done it. And we have considered supporting that. So the one case we're considering for our structural operators is if it's the same trace um, uh, and it's a child of link, then we will support that for the structural operators. We haven't done it yet. It, it's a little bit of a long list kind of thing. But we were considering that one kind of link to support the structural and leaving the rest alone. We just, I'm not sure what the best 
I almost think like a UI application is the best way to support that. Like, you know, you have a Grafana or whatever, you're visualizing your trace, you can see the links uh, directly jumping to some of these other ones. Doing that in aggregate over billions and billions of traces becomes difficult. <laughs> I think you just I need more really metadata. Understand. I didn't understand because the way I'm thinking links are going to get used is mainly for the messaging scenarios. So I didn't follow how you mentioned like having a child span without a parent ID. So for messaging, the way open telemetry supports officially supports messaging is through the, um, excuse me, through the kind Field. So where was that? that was... Yeah, it's a kind, but it's also kind of said um, that when the consumer reads the message, they start a new trace and kind of set up links. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. So I do know one way to one way to pre or to signal an async connection in a trace is through producer consumer and using the parent ID. So you can use parent span ID, produce consumer. That's a fine way. We have a lot of people who push through, yeah. you know, all the different queues on the planet and they communicate, they create a, a producer on one side, consumer on the other. That's async. And then synchronous would be server client. Um, I do, I don't know. I, I'm sh I know, I know I've seen people do what you're saying, create a new trace on the other side with a span link back. Um, but I don't know if there is an official hotel, you know, there kind is. of recommendation here. Uh, I think at least they're working through it. It was a okay. proposal and I can pull out the link there. I think it's probably getting close to be marked as stable. Okay. Uh, I am not super up on open telemetry. When I first started making tempo, I was in the collector SIG calls and participating and contributing to the collector and it exploded so big. And there's so many people and so many SIGs that I kind of dropped out. And we actually have a team at Grafana whose only jobs is to stay apprised of open telemetry and to help build open telemetry and contribute. And so I talk to them a fair amount and they communicate to me and let me know if there's something I should be aware of. Uh, but I, like individual proposals, I'm definitely not going to be up to date on to be truthful. No problem, thank you. Sure. Uh, the target language for the compiler. Um, so we have written ours in Go. Uh, this is our implementation is entirely Go, Tempo is all Go. Um, but I don't think there's any kind of restriction on the kind of language you would use. You know, I don't think there's uh, something uh, important for that. We use to, to show you some of the some of the, the like the nitty gritty. We use um, we use Yak, which is a very old, very standard. I love that we use Yak because I in 1999 when I was in college, I also used Yak to uh, to do some work at my compiler class. Sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, I, I didn't, uh, you know, state my question correctly. What I meant was, what is the output produced by the compiler? Uh, is it is it does it translate to SQL or is it like translates to assembly or what's the output produced by the compiler? All right, I'll be Sorry. producing a series of lectures over the next month on how a TraceQL query is actually. It's a great question. I'm sorry. I'm being facetious. Uh, it's a fantastic question. It's extremely complicated is the short answer. It definitely does not compile it to some other intermediate language. So um, to just let's dumpster dive some code real fast, uh, we create a series of what we call conditions. Uh, the conditions are pushed down. And the conditions are things like uh, we tell a, a, the parquet layer we need things. Like I need the names of spans because they, they put out a condition with the span. I need uh, this attribute or that attribute. So our conditions is a series of um, uh, data that we need from the fetch layer. We also pass down some hints to the fetch layer if it can cheat a little bit and speed things up. That's what this all conditions is. And some of we do some second pass stuff here. So we build this structure, which tells the fetch layer what we need. The fetch layer gives it back. And then we, uh, we have essentially this giant execution engine which piles through all of the uh, all of the spans that come up from uh, from the fetch layer, and then just runs all of the conditions. It's a lot of code. I am I'm, I have no idea how much code is in this package. It's a scary amount to me. And uh, my friend Marty wrote about ninety something percent of it, and it was 
was some of the most fun I've ever had programming because it was just constant work. And it was it's very heads down work, which I like. Um, it's extremely easy to test because it's all logic. Like sometimes you write these tests and there's like network stuff and disk things and it's all complicated. And this was just input out input and output and very direct, easy to test code. Um, and it was a lot of fun to write, frankly. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That, that, I got my answer. Thanks. Sure. Sorry, I think I went off on a tangent there. I apologize. <laughs> Cool. I had a question about, um, I don't know what you'd call it in the tracing world. I'm still kind of new to it, but do you have a way to look at and measure the stall time where you determine how long it took to issue and start a client span from a server span or something similar? Or nested we really, there's a thing, there's an element of our language. I'll show you this. It was put in the very first it was in it was in our initial documents. It's in this very first concept, and we've never implemented it because it's difficult. And I really want it still to this day. And I think this tracks what you're asking. Um, this concept of parent, and the reason I want it for I think what you're asking is because I want to ask this question: parent dot duration or uh, duration minus parent dot duration, which would show something like the amount of time that I consume that my parent my parent doesn't or the reverse, which would, should have some in, like concept of either unmetric or unrecorded space or some concept of, um, uh, of network communications or other things. I think this is, this doesn't exist in the language, but I've considered this, we've talked about this one, my start time minus my parents start time. You're asking for like the gap between when I started and my, when my parents started to see, is there a network issue? Did I spend five seconds doing nothing? And if so, why and that might be like an off cpu thing uh an issue with our communications perhaps um so no and i really want it is the honest truth um we do have this planned but have not implemented or even defined it um uh I wish, yeah start time so you could say from the start of my span it took one second to start this event and so that event might be something like capturing a lock so you could use that kind of a query to look for, it took two seconds to capture a lock, um, for instance. I think, so that that query I think is also kind of in that vein and an important query to have that we're still working on. Cool. And another question, have you thought about it or talked internally about applying this kind of language to profiles as well? No. Um, <laughs> Uh, to, to share how the sausage is made a little bit. Um, the profiling team Pyroscope is a very limited language and it's more of a stream based kind of signal because it's again, a series of data points that come from one process often. So I think they will move more in the prom PromQL uh, direction than we have, but they are also very interested in some of the things we have done because there's a lot of this nested relationships, right? Uh, so we've been talking to them and they are, everybody of course has their hands full and many things to do, um, but uh, they are in the back of their minds. And I think occasionally like having some discussions about what a language would look like for profiles. So I don't think they've made much progress, but there's a lot of thoughts. And I think uh, that's kind of where they are. Um, and it's also true that there are times where I regret making a language and I'm like, why didn't I just make an endpoint? And then we could have built all these experiences on top of the endpoint. And there's times where our profiling team is like, man, I really wish I had a language. How great would it be if I had a language? I could do all these flexible things. So uh, I think both sides have a lot of power, like building just a simple endpoint and extending it for the needs of a front end or building an expressive and complicated language. I'm, ve I'm very happy with what we did, but every once in a while, every six months, I make the team sit down and review decisions made in the past. And one of those that we occasionally talk about is, should we have made TraceQL? Should we have built this or that? Should what decisions we've made differently? I think it's an important part of making software is uh, asking questions about the past. Mm -hmm. Well, and how do you kind of arrive at that question? Because that's a big one right now is how far do you go with trying to provide analytical capabilities in your language where the power users want to be able to really do the expressions and compute everything in the language and spit out the final table or numbers versus just finding the data and providing uh, 
uh, view of it that can then be further processed by a front end or a specific analytical platform like pandas or something like that? How do you kind of determine what line and how you draw that? I think that's a good question. The reason, one of the reasons TraceQL exists is because at the time we started this project, Grafana had a strong um, leaning towards the power user. Uh, we were across the board connecting to developers who were building experiences using Grafana and Prometheus PromQL and then later LogQL and TraceQL. And that was our, like our passionate users. They loved Grafana because they could build anything they wanted. Like, dashboards and panels and they knew how to write all the queries and they like a single SRE could build experiences for whole teams that were all bespoke and custom and cool. So that was just who we connected to as a company. It was the culture of our company to build these tools for the uh, less for the C-level, more for the developer, the person on the ground trying to get the job done. Um, and those are the people who loved Grafana's tools. So that's really a big reason why we went for this language, along with LogQL, um, because that's who we were talking to a lot. And that's who our minds were on. Um, that has definitely drifted some. And as a company, we're figuring out we're more in the balance period now. Like, how do we build tools for other people who are not wanting to type out a giant query language or build dashboards because they think it's cool to make a cool custom dashboard? So uh, as time has gone on, we are finding more balance in that world and looking for more opportunities to build uh, powerful experiences on top of the languages we have now built that do not require you to learn or know some of these languages. And it's why Pyroscope has not quite committed to the language yet because they started later and they started in a period where Grafana is looking at both sides and trying to figure out what the balance is between the power user and the, like, uh, you know, the user who just wants a quick answer. And they don't want to know any learn these new things. They just want to quickly learn what, what why is my endpoint failing? Tell me right now. Okay, I'll go fix it. Thank you. And they don't want that dig in. And I totally respect both aspects of this because there's times where you're waking up by the pager and you don't want to type a giant PromQL query in or a TraceQL query. You just want to click a thing and see the problem and walk away. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Any other questions, folks? Oh, hi. Uh, my, my name is Sunil. Um, I'm a tag security uh, Zero Trust uh, member. So I was curious, um, uh, are there hooks for observability to identify any vulnerabilities or uh, into any existing uh, CNCF uh, adapt, uh, connectors to CNCF projects like Spiffy Spire? I was curious, uh, specifically from a security point of view, uh, how observability has uh, any kind of querying capabilities for any existing uh, projects of CNCF or existing technologies? Uh, I have not thought about that much outside of kind of the obvious things, I think. Uh, I think it's a very good conversation because logs and traces and metrics have so much information about what is occurring that absolutely right. there's an opportunity to mine this data for um, for security events, uh, for sure. Uh, I have not specifically dealt with that with Tempo, but one of the reasons we moved to the Parquet format was so that people would be not constrained by our language. And I see analyzing for security events to be something that might be bespoke enough that you'd want to just uh, directly consume the parquet files, which of course there's a million utilities to do. So if somebody were to come to me and say, I really want to do security with Tempo, I'd point out some of the features of the language. My guess is they would have needs beyond that. And I would say, okay, you probably want a more raw level access to the data. We write parquet files to object storage, write whatever silly you know batch processing job on top of this, analyze this in any way you want. And that would be probably uh, our answer to some of the more complica complicated things. I think you'd probably be looking for, I guess we don't have good ways to surface, for instance, anomalous events, which is something I think a security team would absolutely be interested in. And um, uh, TraceQL, I don't think, has a good way to ask for that kind of question, where you would probably need a different kind of, um, a different kind of method of analyzing the files. So that's interesting. I'd love to hear maybe some of those needs and see where TraceQL lines up and maybe where it could grow in the future. But my guess is it's not quite there to do that in a complete way. 
Yeah. Joe. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think there's a, um, a CNCF security con coming up uh, this week in Seattle. Um, I see some of the one of the agenda has some speakers uh, touching up on some of the areas of observability there. Um, so probably um, I'll see if there is any specific uh, information on uh, you know uh, specific to observability traceability. Um, to have a discussion about. Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. And are you on the CNCF Slack? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll ping you there because I'd be interested to see what kind of querying capabilities you all need. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Sure. All right. Well, it's uh, after 10. So, yeah, thank you very much, Joe. I really appreciate your time. And um, is there any place for uh, folks who have few further questions or watching the video um, where they should contact you? Um, I'd say either through Slack. We have the Grafana community. There's the CNCF Slack. I'm on both of those. Um, and then if you have a specific question about Tempo, the repo would be the best place filing an issue or a discussion there. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Take Very care. Cool. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.